<coughs> well, there's certainly been uh, plenty of distractions this week. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the modification to the side of the building. And uh, you probably haven't noticed, but a rather large branch broke off the tree and fell to the ground. And thankfully, it happened when it did, because if it had happened during a fellowship meal, that could have been catastrophic, because it landed right where the tables were and went across the fence. It's already all been repaired, but if you look at the tree, you'll notice that a huge part of it's missing. Probably over a ton fell off of the tree that much. It was a branch that was this big around and went out way out there. So anyway, that was interesting. We also had a um, false alarm on the, uh, uh, the kitchen alarm and so forth, and that took a little while to wrinkle out or, or to figure out what was going on, and, and uh, also uh, this mural on the side here. So. But thankfully, the Lord provided somebody to uh, repair or clean up, clean up the mess and, and repair the damage uh, real quickly. We found a good uh, handyman who seems to work for a reasonable price. So he's also going to help. He's the one who repaired the wall over here. That, um, and he saw the branch come down, so he came running over here to see if anybody was injured. Uh, as you remember, the, the wall was damaged when somebody came off the street and drove their Honda Civic <laughs> through, our, through the front of the, of the, uh, uh, the lawn here and into the wall and into the, the neighbor's yard. So uh, a few things have been happening recently. I was wondering why I had finished this last week and had extra time this week. Uh, it, it virtually all got taken up in all these different projects. So anyway, there we are. I just hope, um, uh, well, try to, uh, try to draw my attention to what we're doing here. It seems like uh, there's been a lot of distractions, which is why I prayed what I prayed. Well, this morning we're going to look at um, the doctrine of Christ. And uh, first I'll ask, were there any leftover questions from uh, last week with regard to uh, the doctrine of the Word of God? Again, we need to uh, lay the, the, the groundwork, the foundation, before we begin to build on that. If, if this is, in fact, God's Word, and if it's His only revelation, as we saw, His special revelation, although there is general revelation, general revelation doesn't tell us about Jesus Christ, okay? It tells us that God exists, tells us that we're in sin, and so forth. We've, we've broken His commandments, we're guilty. But it doesn't tell us what He has done to save man. We only get that in here. And if this is the only place where God has revealed Himself, then uh, it's our only authoritative source of information for the things we're going to be looking at regarding, uh, well, God's fuller expression of Himself, uh, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what He has done in order to save man. Uh, if this is, in fact, God's Word, everything that it says then about that is true. We need simply to understand it. And, of course, we need to accept it. We need to believe it. Now, uh, I wanted to begin then by uh, just simply asking the question, um, what, what two purposes um, we might say that, that uh, Christ has uh, in, in coming into the world? So we're going to look at... Um, uh, the fact that it's important that we believe in the correct Jesus, the right Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. But um, there, there were two specific purposes that Christ had for coming into the world, and, and I think um, it would be a good place to, if we, well, it would be good if we started there. So, uh, first of all, can anyone think of one of the reasons? I think there's an obvious reason why Christ came into the world, and what was that? Hmm? Okay, to, to provide an atonement, a sacrifice. Uh, to pay for our sins in order to save us, right? But uh, Christ did more than just simply drop into the world and, um, uh, you know, uh, well, go to the cross in order to save us and so forth. He did quite a bit in between, too, didn't he? Uh, and what was the purpose of all the stuff that he did in between? Uh, Brian? Okay, to reveal the Father. And, and one thing we need to realize is that general revelation teaches us a great deal about God. And uh, certainly we have a good deal of information in the Bible as he reveals himself. And that was his purpose in creating everything that he did, which was to reveal himself. He wanted to uh, show his glory. And in showing his glory, that, that is, by the way, why the things have happened in this world that have happened. Uh, we, we ask, the question has been asked in church history whether this is the, the greatest of all conceivable worlds, whether this is the best of all conceivable worlds, and if it isn't, why didn't God make one that was uh, better? But for God's purposes, this is the best, uh, the best conceivable world. Uh, this, the way things have turned out is, is the best way that they could turn out in order for God to accomplish His purpose, which was to reveal His glory. That's the reason why we have a fall. That's the reason why Adam and Eve sinned. That's the reason why the Lord um, allowed it, and even more than that, 
planned it, although again in his planning that it would take place, he certainly did it so that Adam would make his, his choice freely and he didn't force him to sin and so forth. But it was certainly God's intention that Adam and Eve fall. It wasn't his express will. He commanded them not to, uh, not to eat of the tree, but they did. He knew they were going to. That was a part of his plan so that sin could come into the world so that God could do what it is he intended to do, which was to send his son to redeem fallen man. And in doing so, reveal many things about himself that we wouldn't have known in any other way. If Adam hadn't fallen, we would have known of God's grace and goodness and so forth. Maybe not his grace. Well, I guess we would in a certain sense. I mean, God giving to us things that we don't necessarily deserve. The fact that he created us doesn't mean that he's bound necessarily to take care of us. But So that would be gracious. But uh, we wouldn't know about mercy because, um, you know, the, that would be not getting something we deserve that's negative. If we had never fallen, we'd never deserve that. We'd never see his mercy then in not giving us that. We'd never see his judgment. There are many things about God we wouldn't know if, if these things that have happened didn't happen. And realizing that God's glory and his desire to reveal himself is behind all of this, we can understand something more of why the things have happened that have happened. You know, why didn't God prevent the fall? Well, it was because he wanted to reveal his glory. And he was going to do it through redeeming fallen mankind. Okay. Well, God reveals himself in the creation. He reveals himself through this plan of redemption, but especially he reveals himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that, uh, let me just point you, uh, and by the way, as I look through this outline today, it's one of those things where... You know, you, you put it together, you think you have it uh, where you want it, and then you look through it as you're about to teach, and you say, you know, I could have done this better. So I'm going to make, try to make some modifications as I go through. But if you look under A, at the top of the page, um, one, uh, 1B, Christ is the greatest revelation of what God is personally, or we might say what his moral character is. I mean, we, we do, again, understand certain things about God through reading the Bible, through, uh, you know, the examples of the Old Testament before Jesus comes into the world, God's interacting with his people, of his mercy and grace and so forth. And uh, there's many things that we know, but when we see the one who is God become human flesh in order to reveal God to us, we have a much more direct revelation of who God is and, and that is one of the uh, well the greatest reasons why Christ came into the world is so that we might see what God is like and what God would be like we might say if he were a man you know which means what kind of life are we to live in order to glorify God you know, we just look at Christ of course for the most part there are some differences uh, Christ never got married so we don't necessarily look to him for you know example of that but uh, not that it would have been wrong except it wasn't in God's plan of course but um, we, we look to Jesus for the way that he lived to give glory and honor to his Father and so forth. But here's a few texts or a few uh, passages that tell us uh, what Jesus is with regard to his revelation of the Father. If you look at John 1.18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. He has revealed him. That the word is actually the same word in the Greek that we use to uh, refer to um, uh, understanding the scriptures, we call it uh, exegetes or exegesis. Uh, he is the one who has exegeted the Father. He is the one who has uh, explained him to us. That's the idea behind it. Hebrews 1.3, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Uh, I should have backed up a little bit because it says, you know, God revealed himself through the prophets in many portions, in many ways, but in these last days he has revealed himself to us through his Son. And how? Well, the fact that Christ is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And then John 1, 1 and verse 14 reminds us that Christ is in fact God in human flesh. And that's something that's, that we're going to see is important for us to believe regarding Jesus if we are to believe in the Jesus of the Bible and not some false Jesus who can't save us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So one of the, one of the points here is that in order to understand God, 
we need to understand Jesus. Okay? We need to understand his character. We need to understand uh, who he is, what he's like, and so forth. And of, of course, Jesus also communicates to us what it is that God wants us to do. So if we want to know, you know precisely what that is, we look to Jesus for his example. We look to Jesus for his teaching. But we also understand that God sent Jesus into the world for another purpose, and that was also to redeem us, as, as we've already seen. And we are going to look at the work that he did in order to redeem us. Um, there's a, a, um, um, a classification, a, a section of, of uh, doctrine of systematic theology that we, uh, that we call the doctrine of Christ. As we look at the doctrine of Christ, there's two things about him that we need to understand and that is who he is and what he has done. And both of those are important, again, not just to know, but for our salvation. Uh, we really can't be saved, I think I have to make this point pretty strongly, I'm, I'm sure you all agree with me. We can't be saved unless we believe in the Jesus of the Bible. And certainly we can't believe in the Jesus of the Bible unless we believe in the God of the Bible. Uh, I, uh, I may have told you this once before, but I ran into a situation one time where um, a young man came to me and he was um, struggling with his assurance of salvation. And um, since I didn't really know him that well, although I did know he had formerly been a member of, a, of an OP church, one of, one of these in uh, this denomination, and had been a member of that church for something like five years, and then had left that church and had been without a church for six years, I thought I'd better just ask him some of the basic questions, uh, see where he was at theologically before I tried to delve into other areas of his struggle. So I asked him uh, with regard to, to God, what do you believe about God? Do you believe that he's one person? Do you believe he's uh, three persons? And, and he said, well, I believe he's one person, isn't he? And I said, well, what do you believe about Jesus? Do you believe that he's God? Do you believe that he's man? Do you believe that he's God and man? And he said, well, I think he's just God or uh, man, isn't he? And then I asked him the question, well, how, do you, how is a person saved? Is he saved by trusting in Jesus, by trusting in Jesus and, and doing works? or just by his works. He said, well, isn't it by works? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I found the problem of your assurance. You are not a Christian, okay? You are not a Christian. That's why you don't have assurance. You need to be saved. Because you can't be saved without believing the, the truth, without believing in the right God, the right Jesus, the right way of salvation. I mean, his answers would have lined up well with some of these other cults that we uh, will look at here in just a moment. So. In order to come into a, or in order to know God, to understand Him, and in order to come into a relationship with Him, which is saving, we have to know Jesus. We have to know who He is, and we need to know Him personally. We need to come into a relationship with Him uh, through faith. So first of all, we're going to look at who Jesus is, and uh, just again some foundational things here. But hopefully, they'll be uh, they'll be helpful at some level. Okay, we've already seen it doesn't matter what you believe about Jesus because uh, we won't understand or come to know the true God without him. And as a matter of fact, Jesus asked on, on a number of occasions uh, the people around him who he was to see if they understood, you know, uh, why he was there, who he was, what he was doing, and so forth. Uh, when he asked, uh, for instance, the Pharisees in Matthew 22, 42, what do you think about the Christ Whose son is he? And, and they understood something about the Christ. They just didn't understand that he was the Christ. And actually, they, they also misunderstood uh, because uh, they didn't understand he was going to be God in human flesh. They said, well, he's the son of David. Well, then why does David in the Spirit call him Lord? And then he quotes a passage where he does that, and they weren't able to answer him. He was trying to bear out, of course, the fact that, that Christ was more than just the son of David. He was going to be greater than David. He was actually God in human flesh. And then he asked his disciples in uh, Matthew 16, verse 13, who do people say the Son of Man is? And as they gave the different uh, answers to that question, he then said, but who do you say the Son of Man is? And then, uh, of course, Peter answers correctly, and it was sort of like, seems well, actually, Jesus said it was a flash of inspiration, wasn't it? Revelation. Um, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter, when he says you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I mean, that sort of sums it all up. You're the Messiah. And more than that, you are the Son of God. Okay, well, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven. It's important that we understand who Jesus is. 
Now I point out that we're not saved by a name, are we? The name Jesus doesn't save us. There's a lot of people who are named Jesus. As a matter of fact, that wasn't an unusual name. Even in those days, there were people, there was even, you know, there was what, Simon Bar Jesus, I think we find, who was uh, the son of Jesus, but not the same Jesus that we're talking about. Today, there are many people named Jesus. Uh, again, the, you know, there's, there's people that drive taxi down in Mexico somewhere named Jesus, and, and they can't save you, right? Well, in the same way, if, if a religion pops up, uh, I mean, Islam, for instance, believes in a Jesus, but the Jesus they believe in is not the same as the Jesus of the Bible. Does anybody know what, what Islam believes regarding Jesus? Prophet. What's that? Just a prophet. Just a prophet, okay? Not, not the Son of God, not uh, God in human flesh, but he's not even the greatest prophet, is he? There's one that's greater as far as they're concerned. Okay, and then we have uh, the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, what's different about their Jesus than our Jesus? Or the Jesus of the Bible, I should say. Which I hope is our Jesus, Brian. Okay, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, we had come to a part in uh, the book of Revelation where we actually said that could be true, you know. But if it's true that he's Michael the Archangel, it's not true, though, that he is what they think Michael the Archangel is, which is what? Okay. So if, in their idea, though, who would they believe Michael the Archangel is? I mean, in, in this view, he would have to be the, the second person of the Godhead if, if, we, if Michael, in fact, does represent Christ. Okay? But in their idea, Michael the Archangel is not one of the persons of the Godhead. Who, who do they think he is? Just a created being, a, an angel created like the other angels. And that that angel was actually made into a man. Okay? So a created being was made into another created being. Um, and again, that is not the, uh, the Christ that we understand the Bible teaches. He's obviously not a created being. He is the creator, the eternal one. Okay? And then what about the Jesus of the Mormons? Do they believe in a different Jesus than we believe in? Now, how, how is it that he's different? Anybody want to... Okay, uh, Brian, you want to take a crack at that one too? Uh, yeah, Okay, he's a, they believe that Christ is the brother of Lucifer, that's right. And anything else? How did, how did Christ come into existence? How did Lucifer come into existence? What's their, their, their brothers, who's their, who's their father, and how did they become his children? Oh, okay. Well, it, it's a rather bizarre story, but um, they do believe that Elohim is the father, which is just basically the... the uh, Actually, it's the uh, okay. It is the he the Hebrew uh, word for for God, and it's a it's a plural word. Um, anyway, they believe that he was once a man on a planet who was faithful to the God who created that planet, and he was actually elevated to godhood. And that he has his own planet. He has uh, wives. He was a polygamist in his life, and and the wives that he liked on the day of the, of the resurrection. He called out of the grave, and they are his, his celestial wives on this planet, which actually has a name called Koloff, and I don't remember that. But anyway, uh, he is having relations with these, these wives on this planet, and he was producing spiritual children. And that's how Jesus and Lucifer are both brothers, okay? And then, as a god of his planet, uh, he wanted to create a world and create people in that world, and, and the spirits that actually um, animate those people that are, that are created on the planet are the spirits of the, of the children that he had sired while on Koloff, okay, or on this planet. Or, no, the star's called Koloff. The planet is near a star called Koloff. That's what it is. Okay. So, anyway, he wanted also to work out a plan of redemption. Satan offered, or Lucifer offered his plan. Jesus offered his plan. And Elohim went with Jesus' plan. He liked it better. Lucifer rebelled, and he took a, a third of the spirits with him, okay, in that rebellion. And they, they were cursed then to become disembodied spirits. They would never then be born into uh, families. Uh, there was a third that sided with Jesus, and they were uh, then destined to become born into white Caucasian families. Uh, they're called light, light into lightsome is the, the term that they used. And then there was a third that, that were undecided, and they were actually cursed to be born into black or dark-skinned races. And so for a while in their religion, uh, you, a uh, person who was black or dark-skinned could not actually become a Mormon, but that, that has changed. Okay. So anyway, now that just accounts for 
the, the spiritual aspect of Jesus, but it tells us, first of all, their God is a created being. He is not the creator, uh, because he was once a man, which means he's not unchangeable and, and everything that the Bible tells us about God. And um, uh, with regard to uh, Jesus, he has not always existed. Uh, he's the result of uh, relations between Elohim and one of his celestial brides. And then with regard to the human body of Jesus, Elohim himself came down personally and had relations with the Virgin Mary to produce the physical body of Christ, which is utter blasphemy. The whole thing is, is, is blasphemy. So his, his, that's how the physical aspect was born, and then the, uh, the spiritual part came from his relations with the spiritual wife up on this planet. Now, let me ask you this question. Is that the Jesus of the Bible? But if you were to talk to a Mormon, they would say they believe in the same Jesus you believe in. And if you were to point out to them that your Jesus is different, they would say, oh, well, somebody's changed the Bible and it doesn't agree with the authority, which happens to be uh, Joseph Smith's writings okay. and their Book of Mormon and so forth. Okay, so it does matter what you believe regarding Jesus because you have a name, but what does that name describe? Who is it referring to? It has to refer to the right person, right? The right being. It can't be the taxi driver and it can't be the, the uh, angel that was made into a man and it can't be this you know, uh, Mormon idea and it can't be just a man or a prophet of God. It has to be the Jesus of the Bible. So what is it that you need to know then about Jesus in order to believe in the right Jesus, the one who actually can save you, the one who can bring you into a relationship with, with God? Well, the first thing is at the top of uh, page two, you do have to believe that he is the Son of God because the Bible says that he is the Son of God. Okay, uh, And again, this is, that's why the, the first section we looked at is so important. The Bible is the authority. Okay? It is, without question, God's revelation of himself. So we don't try to prove what the Bible says is true at every point. Once we've proven that the Bible is true and we know it's God's word, we simply submit to it as the authority for the reasons we've already seen over the past several weeks. But what does the Bible say about Jesus? Well, in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Uh, you have to believe that he is the Son of God. Okay? Now, um, one thing that occurs to me is that there is a couple different senses in which Jesus is the Son of God. I don't think I've included that in here. It's, when you're sitting down to prepare these things versus actually getting up and, and teaching them, things occur to you while you're teaching. They don't occur while you're writing. So... That makes it a little bit difficult sometimes. But anyway, uh, let me just back up for a minute. Uh, in order for Jesus to be God the Son, we have to make some distinctions. We have to realize that the God of which he is the Son is a particular God. I already mentioned that, um, y well, y you have to have the right God in order to have the right Jesus. Now, what is it that's true about the God of the Bible that isn't true about the gods of these other religions that we've already talked about? What, what is it that, um, what is the God of Islam like? He may be, he may be infinite, he may be, I wouldn't say he's unchangeable, he's not unchangeable. Uh, he may be eternal, I think they believe those things regarding him, yes? The God of the Bible is Okay, there's a real big difference. The God of the Bible is good, he is holy and righteous, and their God is immoral. Okay, their God just requires destruction of life for, well, just because they don't hold to that particular, let's say, faith. Well, um, he promises those that are faithful if they die in a holy war that they go to, to be in this sort of celestial, um, well, orgy might be the, the right word for it, which we would say is, is immoral. God doesn't engage in those kinds of things nor does he uh, uh, commend it to anyone. As a matter of fact, I think their God even forbids that on earth, but somehow allows it in, in heaven. Uh, what else is different about their God than the God of the Bible, besides the fact that th their God doesn't really exist, and ours does? <laughs> Sounds, you know, <laughs> well, anyway. But what, what else is different? Something, uh, that was a very main thing. Uh, theirs is unholy, ours is holy. Yes, Donna? Yeah, I don't know if their God is a created being or not. Um, I think he may be the eternal God. I, I'm not sure. But certainly, um, with regard to Mormonism, that's a, a big difference. Uh, how many persons is that God, Jerry? Yeah, just, just one person. 
Okay. Now, with regard to the God of the Mormons, I've already told you, he was a man who became a God. Okay. That's not the God of the Bible. And it's only one person and not three. That's not the God of the Bible. And then with regard to the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, what is their main contention? I'm sure they have many other deviations, but what is their main difference between uh, their God and the God of the Bible, Jerry? Uh, well, Jesus is not God. Okay, Jesus is not God. And how many persons is their God? Just, just one person again. Okay. That actually sets Christianity apart, or the God of the Bible apart, from every other God that, that people have created in their own understanding. Their God is just one person, and ours, or the one, I keep saying ours, but the one of the Bible, which I hope is ours, um, is three persons. Okay, so that, that is a, a very large difference. Uh, in, well, in, in the, the Bible, God reveals himself as three persons and not just one. And you've, maybe you've talked to Jehovah's Witnesses at the door and you've haggled with them about the fact that Jesus is God and you, you can't get them to admit that because if they did, they'd have to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses because that is one of the... I mean, that's their main selling point. That's their main difference. You believe in a pagan god, they would say, a god of the Egyptians, or uh, you, know, uh, you believe in polytheism, and that's, that's a pagan religion. The true religion is monotheism, and that's what we believe, one god and that one God is one person. Are, are we monotheistic, by the way? Yes, we are monotheistic. We believe in one God. But they think, as we saw before, that to say that God is one and to say that God at the same time is three is a contradiction. And we say, no, it's not a contradiction because he's not one and three in the same sense. He is one being and three persons. And that's certainly what the Bible says. Now, here's, here's some evidence to that effect. Let's go ahead and look at that. Obviously, there's no question that the Father is God. Okay, that's quite plain. 1 Corinthians 8 verses 5 and 6. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things and we exist for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we exist through Him. By the way, we'll, we'll have to um, come back and see the, the distinction here between the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ because when he becomes a man he actually is in a certain sense distinguished from the being of God because it's a different nature. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute. But uh, let's see what else. Um, So-called God's notice. There are many of those but there is really only one God the Father. The Spirit is God and here's a simple argument and we don't have time to fill all this out. Uh, we could see, could see the fact that the Spirit is a person, the Spirit creates, the Spirit withdraws. Uh, I mean, he's active in creation. Uh, he, uh, here, he's, when he's lied to, basically, um, it is said that, that God is the one who has been lied to, or the one who has been lied to is God. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Notice you've lied to the Holy Spirit, you've lied to God. And when you add that to the fact that, you know, for instance, Jesus says, go and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is, is paralleled with the Father and the Son uh, why would that be the case unless he was, of course, equal with him? But he also creates, he is also eternal, he also is personal, and here he's called as directly as you can, you know, about as directly as you can expect, he's called God. And then, of course, the big question, Jesus is God. You know, is Jesus God? Well, of course, he is the eternal Son of God. We've already seen that in John 1, verses 1 through 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Again, in verse 18, we see the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it says here, the Word, and remember the, the word, word here in Greek is logos or reason. Christ is the Word of God. It's the Spirit of Christ who gives the Scripture. He is the one who reveals God. That's, and the Word is a revelation of God. And when the Word becomes flesh, we see God uh, 
basically revealing himself in in terms that we can understand because he actually becomes one with us. He uses our language. He, he lives in our culture and we get to see what God is like. But then he gives the word of God through his spirit. And again, he, he reveals God. So Jesus is the one, or, or the Son of God is the one who reveals God. And that's why he's called the word of God. And it says that the word was with God. The word was God. Okay, He's basically always been God. Uh, he is the one who created all things. In verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. That's referring to Christ. Uh, Jesus says regarding himself that he is one being with the Father. In John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. By the way, um, here's another thing that, that's important uh, to understand, if, to have the correct God and to have the correct Jesus. Uh, there, there is a particular uh, cult that looks at this verse and says that when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, what he means is not one being, as we say, God is one, but that he is one person, that, that I and the Father are one person. Okay? Can you think of, of who says that? It's an ancient heresy, but it has a modern expression. Uh, Jan, you had your hand up first. modern expression would be the United Pentecostals. Okay, United Pentecostals, uh, UP, we call UPC, although there is a uh, United Presbyterian Church that also has a UPC, uh, um, which doesn't fall into that particular heresy, but they have other problems. Um, okay, uh, and the Apostolic Church too, yes, Jerry? Well, Arianism actually held a very similar view to the Jehovah's Witnesses in that they denied the deity of the Son, but they did believe that the Son and the Father were separate persons. Um, there was a, an heresy that was called um, modalism, uh, modalistic monarchianism, it's some fancy terms, but it, it basically taught that, uh, that God, who is one person, reveals himself in different ways at different times. So in the Old Testament, he reveals himself as the Father, in the New Testament as the Son, and then basically when the Son is, goes back into heaven, he sends the Spirit, he reveals himself as the Spirit. So they're all three one person. Now that's not what this text is teaching. And if you believe that, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are just one person, then you believe in a false God. Okay? They believe in a false God. The Bible clearly teaches us that isn't the case. For instance, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father. The Father sends the Son into the world. The Son comes that He might honor the Father. The Son prays to the Father. The Father speaks to the Son out of heaven. Uh, the, the son says he has to leave, otherwise he can't send the Holy Spirit. Uh, he talks about, you know, the, the, the Spirit obviously is, is something, as someone who is sent, uh, who does a particular work that's different than what the Father and the Son do. I mean, there, there's all these distinctions that show us that they are not the same person, and that's not what this text says anyway. It basically literally says that, uh, and, and this is something you'd have to understand from uh, the Greek, and we have something similar in English. He she and it. Okay, What's the difference between those three pronouns? Gender, right? Masculine, feminine, and neuter, right? Well, the same thing is true in the Greek. You have masculine, feminine, and neuter. And if, by the way, the, 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 the word one is an adjective, and it can occur in any one of those three genders, right? And if Jesus had intended to say that he and the Father were one person, he would have probably used the masculine pronoun here. We are one person, you know, basically one uh, masculine, one because the masculine pronoun is used to refer to God and so forth. Not feminine, not neuter. Okay? Uh, but the one that's used here is actually neuter, which means we are one thing or one essence or one being. And I think all that he was pointing to was the fact that God is one. I and the Father are one. There is only one God. We, are, we both are basically of that one essence, but we are separate persons. Okay. And then the next one, Colossians 2, 9, For in Him, that is in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And uh, John 14, 9, this again, I just point out, it's no wonder when Jesus said to Philip, when he asked Jesus to show him the Father, since he came to reveal him and exegete him and so forth. Uh, have I been with you so long, or have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. 
how can you say, show us the Father? Now you can see how the oneness Pentecostals would get a hold of this and say, you see, Jesus is saying, I'm the Father. But he doesn't say, I am the Father. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Which means that Jesus, being the exact representation of his nature and the one who comes to reveal God, reveals him perfectly. And when you see Jesus and you see that character, you are seeing the Father as well. It doesn't mean that he is the Father. Okay. So they share the same nature, though they are different persons. Uh, I mentioned uh, before that there are two senses in which Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, one of them, I think, is quite obvious, and that is that, that he is the eternal Son of God. Okay? Uh, there is another sense in which he is the Son of God, and it may be obvious too, but um, in, in what other way is Jesus the Son of God? Besides being eternally begotten from the Father, what, what else makes him the Son of God? Yeah. Well, I, I suppose that would be another sense. He's um, one who is his servant and, and one who uh, is, is perfectly in submission to him. And I suppose when, when we are trusting in Jesus and so forth, we're called sons and daughters of God and so forth. But actually in a more literal sense. Jerry? Yeah, he's, he's the son of God in the sense that, that God is his father and conceived his, his nature, his human nature, in the womb of the virgin. And so he was born, for the, you know, well, in, in what uh, Gabriel says to, to Mary, uh, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you, the power of the Most High shall come upon you, and for that reason this offspring will be called the son of God. Okay, so the son of God also does refer to the fact that God is his father of, of the human nature, but it, 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 even before that incarnation, which means you know taking upon yourself flesh, uh, he was the eternally begotten Son of God, which doesn't mean that he was. It was in God's plan that he would be begotten from all eternity uh, and come into the world and so forth. That that was planned, and that's why he's called the eternally begotten Son of God. But because from eternity, eternity he is begotten of God. That's what we call. Um, well, there's. Um, Let's see, I remember what it is called. <laughs> there's, uh, there's different ways that the Trinity is described, um, different relationships that they have, and there's what are called the um, intra-Trinitarian relationships, which means, you know, within. In, intra-murals, you know, is where you have, uh, I think, you've got your team, and uh, let's say you're in a particular school, and they've got maybe a football team, and they're going to do intramurals. That means you have everybody on that team play each other because they're, they're, uh, it's all within that group, okay? And then you have, I think, inter, intermural, I think maybe another term, but it's where you have other schools and you're interacting with them, inter, rather than intra. Well, in, in one sense, when you think of God as who he is in and of himself, he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and those words really describe the relationships that those three persons have with one another, that they've had from all eternity. And then there are what are called the, uh, uh, what we call the economic trinity are the relationships that they enter into in order to work out salvation. And if you confuse those two, which Jehovah's Witnesses frequently do, you see in the economic trinity the son taking a subordinate role and becoming a man and becoming a servant of his father. And the Jehovah Witness looks at that and you say, ah, you see, Jesus says the father is greater than I. Uh, Jesus says there are certain things I don't know and the angels don't know, but only the Father knows. How can he be God? Well, the fact is that's Jesus in his human nature as he's uh, in the um, covenant of grace, has taken the subordinate role, he's become a servant, you know, taking upon himself human nature and the limitations of human nature. Uh, that is why he says the things that he does. Okay? But with regard to his eternal begottenness and the, the Godhead itself, there is no subordination. They are all equally God. They all share the attributes of God. Um, they are all to be glorified and honored as God. But yet those three names are used to, which are used to distinguish the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do express a difference between them, which is, was in, which is interesting. This, this actually um, gets back to a, a debate, um, or maybe not a debate, but at least something that was uh, examined in the uh, history of the church and that is the eternal begottenness of the Son and the eternal procession of the Spirit. Um, what, what is different between the, the Son and the Father? Why is the Father called the Father and the Son called the Son? 
and why is the spirit called the spirit? Are those just arbitrary titles that they decided to, uh, to express themselves by or did they actually communicate something that is distinct about them? Even though you know, they, they possess the same being, God is one being and they have all the, the same attributes, is there anything different uh, between the persons themselves? Well, they've, they've come to this conclusion that when it says that Jesus is the only begotten and the eternally begotten Son of God, what that means is that He is the Son because He's begotten of the Father. And that's why the term Son is given to Him. And that's also why it's the Son who, is, who comes into the world and is uh, uh, the Son of God, the one who is actually conceived in the womb of the Virgin. Why wasn't it the Spirit? Why didn't the Father come? Well, the Son is eternally begotten and now He's begotten in time. And the fact that he already sustains this relationship to the Father as a son to the Father uh, is, is the reason why he is the one that, that took that particular role. So this, this is called the eternal generation of the Son. And it can get kind of complicated, but let me just put it this way, that, that this is something that has always been. There was never a time when the Son did not exist. This is an eternal begottenness. Okay? Uh, it's, it's something that God's nature does necessarily, gives rise to the Son. Uh, there's been attempts to explain how that could possibly be. Um, one of the explanations that Edwards gave was that the Father loves himself with a perfect love because there's no greater object of, of love and plus at a certain point in existence, can't really use the word time, he was the only one or the only thing that existed. Okay, although. God existed. I mean, not, not just the Father, but God existed. But his eternally contemplating his own image, which is the, the most beautiful and glorious thing that he could possibly imagine, um, gives rise to the Son. Okay, I know that sounds really strange, but um, the idea is that um, there's this, this perfect love that the Father has for the Son because the Son is exactly like him and so forth. But, and then the love that they share amongst themselves is breathed out eternally um, in, in the spirit of love and gives rise to, as it were, another uh, person in the Godhead. It, it, it really is beyond our understanding how, the, how they could possibly uh, be what they are. But the idea is that the Father is called the Father because He begets the Son and the Spirit is called the Spirit because He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Um, the Spirit means breath and the idea that Edwards talked about is the love that they have that's breathed out toward one another which not is, is not a literal exhaling like we have, but it, it's, it's just, it emanates toward each other eternally, and, and that love is a personal love that is the person of the Spirit, which is why the fruit of the Spirit is love. And he, you know, he uh, looks at the different work that each of them do in the economic trinity as they work out the work of, of salvation. And he sees that these, these names actually fit quite well with the, the distinctive characteristic of each one of them. Um, so the Spirit is the one who breathes life. The Spirit is the one who breathes the love of God into our hearts. He is the love of God that the Father and the Son share, and yet He is personal, and He is a separate person, uh, and so forth. But we won't get any, any further into that, but um, that, that was just an interesting uh, sidetrack. Okay, so the idea is that Jesus is God the Son. He is the eternally begotten Son of God, and He is the one who becomes then uh, begotten in time in the womb of the virgin which actually brings us into the next point which is that Jesus is the son of God or the son of man excuse me and let's just see we'll just round off this point so we'll at least get to see who Jesus is and then we'll look at his work next time okay uh, we must also believe in order to believe in the true Jesus of the Bible the one who can save us that he is the son of man that he is fully man okay John 3:13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. I think you understand that, um, uh, well, again, here's the, the, the verse I was, I think, quoting earlier, or at least one similar, that he's conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The angel said to Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. We know that uh, Jesus was, was born into this world, a human being, that he grew up, that it says in Luke 2.52 that he kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, which means he was learning and he was growing. Okay? He experienced all of our weaknesses of our humanity. Matthew 4.2 is one example. And after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. 
uh, he, he died obviously and was risen and raised again from the dead uh, Romans 8 verses 33 through 34 uh, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Uh, the idea is that the one who is eternally God took upon himself a human nature. He became one with us. And we'll, we'll see later on why it is he had to be one with us. But this is the way it's summarized in the Westminster Confession of Faith, actually the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Now, a couple of things to, to bear in mind here. We may have to spend a little bit more time on this uh, next week because I don't want to go over time this morning. But uh, the, 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 the teaching about Christ is that, that he is one person, but he has two natures. Okay. When Christ became a man, he didn't take to himself a human nature that had another person already in it, if I can put it that way, uh, as though the body came with a person. He is the person that is in that human nature. And as a person, he possesses two whole natures that are distinct and are separate. Uh, there's, there's been debates throughout church history that, that they've had to iron this whole thing out, and some have taken the two natures and combined them. So you have something that's neither God nor man anymore, but you have some new thing, uh, which is one nature, but it's, not, it's neither of the two that it was before, in which case you no longer have God, you no longer have man, and you no longer have salvation because our Redeemer needs to be both God and man. And there have been those who have um, uh, wanted to uh, put the, uh, somehow uh, a human nature or the human person and then put the Logos in there somewhere so that you don't have anything that's something that's fully human any longer. Um, that's, that's a little bit complicated, but the idea is that, that people are a spirit, a soul, and a body. And they believe he had a human soul, a human body, but that his spirit is the divine logos. And so that portion then of his being is no longer human, and he's no longer human. Okay? So they say, well, it can't be that way. Besides that, we only have two parts to us anyway. It's basically a soul and a body. And soul and spirit are used interchangeably in scripture. Um, well, the idea that, that Christ is actually a whole man with, with his, his own person and that uh, by his anointing with the Holy Spirit, somehow this, the uh, divine Logos came upon him and, and sort of identified that person with the person of the God, uh, of the Son of God, which again makes him a separate person. There's all these different ways it was worked out. But the main thing is, he has two natures and he's one person. That person is divine, okay? Which is why as a man he receives worship. Uh, why as a man he can sometimes, you know, command... Uh, creation and it obeys him. Uh, why even you know uh, Satan basically had to uh, uh, was repelled by by the authority of his word and so forth. Um, why the the de you know the, he did the things that he did and he was also anointed with the Holy Spirit who gave him the ability to do these things and it was very likely in the power of the Spirit that he often did these miracles and so forth. But yet the fact that his person is recognized as uh, you know by the demons as the son of God uh, to whom they must submit and uh, why when his disciples uh, you know worshipped him in the boat after he stilled the wind and the waves you were certainly God's son he didn't say get up I'm just a creature like you are don't worship me worship God which is what the angel said when John you know got on his knees to worship him after he showed him that revelation Jesus doesn't say that because Jesus is worthy of worship because he is divine but at the same time, in his human nature, he has all these limitations of human nature. He gets hungry. He, he very likely got sick. That's something we don't have any record of, but we shouldn't suspect that, that his life was any different because he wasn't perfect humanity. He took upon himself the, the likeness of sinful flesh, even though he was without sin. He was certainly subject to death. And um, anyway, he went through everything that we went through. He even grew up. He even learned. Uh, he doesn't come into the world with infinite knowledge. Uh, and here's one thing, let me just throw on the uh, throw out and uh, you can um, uh, think about this, maybe we can talk about it a little bit more next week, but um, 
Christ in his human nature, though he is a divine person, did have all the limitations of humanity with regard to his strength, with regard to his um, ability to exist without food. Uh, he was no longer, as a, as a man, he was not independent, as God is independent, who doesn't depend upon anything for his existence. He needed to eat, he needed to drink, he needed to sleep, he needed to breathe. He couldn't just go underwater and you know, be under there for hours and so forth. Um, he had our limitations, and he had that same limitation with regard to his understanding. He didn't have infinite knowledge. What he did have was communicated to him by the Holy Spirit, and things were revealed to him. And he did, as Edwards would say, uh, by way of memory, reminiscence as it were, remember that he was with the Father from all eternity, but he remembered it as a man thinks about it, and not as God. And that's why Jesus could say, for instance, of that day and that hour, no one knows, not the, not the angels, you know, not the Son of Man, but the Father only. You know, if you've ever wrestled with that question, how could Jesus say that, who has, is God and has infinite knowledge? It's because in his humanity, he doesn't have infinite knowledge. He doesn't have divine knowledge. He has human knowledge. Okay? And the things that, that, again, are revealed to him as he knows what's in the hearts of all men and um, you know, certain things that were revealed to him while, while he was on the earth were revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't because he was carrying around in his human nature this infinite mind. That, that comprehended all things perfectly. You know, that, that's not the way that Jesus was. He, has, he had all those limitations. Now, he didn't have those limitations in his divine nature. And if you can conceive of this, his, his personality was also existed outside of that human nature in his divine nature, and it was everywhere, and it was all-knowing and so forth. And so in his divinity, the person knew everything, but in his humanity, he didn't. And that really explains the, the kenotic theory, the, the uh, kenosis, the idea that when Christ empties himself, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, uh, though he was in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. That emptying did not mean that he stripped himself of divine attributes when he became a man, but what it means is he took on himself the limitations of humanity in that human nature. So the, the person of Christ being everywhere at once because he is divine, in that human nature has the limitations of humanity. And that's the, the person who is speaking from that humanity. He is fully man with, with those full limitations. Does that make, does that make sense? It may raise some questions, but does that make sense? But that explains, if a Jehovah's Witness, if you can understand that, and you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, you can explain to them, well... When Jesus became a man, in, in his humanity, he had the limitations of human nature, and there were certain things that were not revealed to his human mind. But in his divine nature, he knew everything perfectly. And you can see there's not a connection then between his human mind that's, that's a clear and comprehensive connection so that he has access you know, to, to all this information. Uh, it, it was not, everything was not revealed to him because his finite human mind could not comprehend infinite knowledge. Steve? But that's still the same, that's still the same You mean as far as, as far as in his humanity, yes. Although his, his human mind does seem to be vastly extended uh, now that he's glorified uh, because he's ruling over all the nations of the earth as the God-man and appear, appears to be aware of a, of a number of things. And how do we consistent as well with the glorification of our mind over our heart? When, when we're glorified, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're, we're going to expand and we're going to learn throughout eternity, but we're never going to have infinite knowledge. Yeah. But just make sure you, you guard the idea that that is only true of Christ in his humanity and not in his deity because he still has infinite knowledge as God. It's just that it almost sounds like we're making him two persons, but we're not. It's that person, he has all the attributes of, of divinity which include infinite knowledge, as well as he's eternal and he's independent and he doesn't need anything for his happiness or for his existence. All those things are true of his deity, but in his humanity he could die, you know, and he could get hungry. This is talking about while he was on earth. Uh, he could get sick, perhaps. He could, um, he could experience everything that a human does, and we, we, we usually don't have any problem reconciling those ideas. 
He has infinite strength, but he's weak. He doesn't need anything, but he needs the things we need to sustain himself. You know, um, he's infinitely happy, but he can suffer. Okay? We have to keep those things separate. These things are true of his divine nature. These things are true of his human nature. He has infinite knowledge. He has limited knowledge. Is there any difference between that and the other examples? So if you can keep those separate, at least you'll be able to understand how Jesus could say, the Father is greater than I. He could say that from the aspect of his humanity. God is, in his being, is much greater than I am. Or in his role of submitting to the Father's will, in order to work out redemption, he has taken a subordinate role in his humanity. Okay? The Father is greater in authority than I. But the Son then gets raised to the place of greatest authority. And he can also say, I don't know the day or the hour in his humanity, but yet know it in his deity as a part of his divine nature. But in some of his, how much in and bounds did he know? I mean, and in his human nature, did he know that he was going to pay the price for sin? I mean, how, this tends to be, like you say, it's just revealed to him. It, it, it is because, I mean, for instance, you, you have to make sense out of this passage that we looked at earlier. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, Luke 2.52. Now, how could one with infinite knowledge and wisdom increase in wisdom? You see, you can't because you've already got everything it could possibly be. So he was actually growing in his understanding. And the, the question is, at what point did he understand who he was and, and what it was he came into the world to do. And that's something that we may not be able to pinpoint precisely, but we'd say when he was an infant in the womb, he didn't understand it. Okay? When he was born, at some point, when he went to the temple, he was, you know, uh, uh, let's see, when he was debating with the, uh, the teachers or asking them questions, and he said, didn't, you know, when the parents came looking for him, didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? At that point, he understood something, even though the parents didn't seem to understand it, so it didn't come some, so much from them as it was something that was revealed to him at certain stages. So a, as he was growing up, apparently he was becoming increasingly aware of, of exactly what he was there to do. I, I know we often conceive of Jesus as coming into the world as sort of this infinite, you know, all this with this infinite knowledge and knowing precisely what he's doing while he's developing in the womb, but the idea is that probably wasn't the case. And at some point he's He's growing in this understanding as things go on. And I imagine at some point his parents must have told him, son, you didn't come into the world the way everybody else did, you know. Um, and I'm sure he understood that. Um, and certainly by the time he, he appears to, um, you know, for his public um, appearance to Israel, and he's uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit at that point, he is anointed with the Spirit above measure. And uh, it, it seems with that comes a, a great deal more uh, certainly the, the ability to begin to do things that, that he wasn't doing before. Uh, Edwards believed, for instance, that the knowledge that Jesus Christ had and, and the equipping that included that knowledge to do the work of redemption came through the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't that he didn't have the Spirit beforehand. He certainly did ministry in his life, but at, at his baptism there was a great outpouring of the Spirit and anointing upon him to begin to do the work the Lord called him to do. And maybe at that point that he knew more than he had known before. But I think he knew what he was all about at that point, certainly, and uh, what he was going to do. So it, it sounds a little different than the way we're used to thinking of it. We don't, but we do have to take into account that he did grow in, in wisdom, and he, he is fully a man, and uh, he didn't have infinite knowledge, otherwise we can't make any sense out of the fact that he was ignorant of certain things, you know. Certainly things were revealed to him, certain things were not revealed to him but he didn't have infinite knowledge. Okay. So, anyway, that, that's a big topic. Yes, uh, Brian? Uh, you might understand this is hard to grasp. You know, we have to remember that he was operating in his humanity, on Earth, in the human body, but never, you know, losing any of his divine qualities. That's right, yes. He didn't lose any of his divine qualities, and he was living as a man. Uh, experienced our weaknesses. Uh, again, infinite strength and <laughs> very limited strength. We, we don't seem to have difficulty with that, you know, but um, the idea of infinite knowledge and limited knowledge, that gives us a little bit more difficulty. Okay. Yes, sinless. 
word is that at all times he's aware of the mind because of the cynicism. Well, again, the, the question of when did he become aware of the fact he was the son of God, I don't know, I don't know if, we, if we know exactly or precisely when that happened. Um, but I'm sure that um, as he, you know, a child reaches an age where they begin to become aware of themselves and, and so forth, uh, because he didn't have the uh, sinful nature, he wouldn't have done a lot of the things that children would do, or that children do, you know, when, when they're that age. So he wasn't throwing tantrums. I mean, sure, he cried when he was hungry, but it was a righteous, <laughs> a righteous cry that he was hungry to alert his parents and not screaming and fussing until he was, you know, red in the face and angry. You know, that stuff wouldn't have occurred. Uh, so anyway, yeah. The uh, but you, I tell you what, think about that because there's a, a number of things that that um, you know questions that may uh, arise and. Uh, we can discuss that next time, but we're, we're well out of time now. Are there any last questions that are just burning questions? Uh, okay, then let's have a word of prayer and we'll, we'll get ready for the service.